for stuff that's public comment, that's anything that's not on the agenda. Seeing nothing, approval of the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. I will second. That's so why I just wanted to say something and then leave. Oh. Wait, I think I think we do have somebody in the room who had public comment. If you want to do that real quick before you move to. Yep. Uh, we can't hear the. Not here real well. Hang on. Would it help if I took off the mask? Maybe. Yeah. Okay, go back to public comment. Okay, I'm Linda Grimes. I'm on the executive board at Chandler, and I just wanted to let you know we have four new board or four new uh, employees that are taking the place of the two employees that left. Um, this year is the 30th year for the uh, New World Festival, and we're hoping to do things up really much better than. Well, obviously since COVID, um, but we have, uh, you know, some outdoor venues. Uh, unfortunately, the stage that we have at Far Hill was not big enough for the, um, the orchestra to come, so they, <laughs> three times, uh, so they canceled this year in Randolph, and but we will have them back next year. But it'll probably be an indoor event rather than than outdoors. And that's pretty much all I need to share. So has the new um, one of the new employees that's taking over for Seth? Is that person doing the sound and all those? There sorts? are three people. Three, there are three Seths. Yes. That doesn't surprise <laughs> me. It takes three. Yes, to replace Seth. That's <laughs> quite true. Wow. And and then we do have Shannon, who is the uh, is doing the accounting. So, but she was already there and has been for a while, and it's just. But Seth was doing that, so now she is doing all of that. So that leaves the other people to do the uh, all of the technical, and I, I'm sure they'll probably be real involved with the summer events that we have down up at Forest Hills. Okay, any okay. more? Uh, the people that just came in was any of that for public comment? Nope, you guys are here for First okay, Fridays for and public Heather, comment. you're okay. here for the, yeah, Great. so they're here for later Let's stuff. keep the um, agenda moving, so okay. on to approval of the agenda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Approval of the agenda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. So move. Can I have a second? Uh, second. Send a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Consent calendar, we have meeting minutes and warrants. I have two things on the minutes. Um, on page two, Line 64, I talked with Trevor about this earlier. John Kaplan stated that he supports the narrower two-way traffic option, and we agreed there wasn't actually an option. That option hasn't been uh, discussed yet seriously. So that may be in the future, so it'd probably more, make more sense to say that John supports a narrower two-way traffic option. And the other one, I think before we went into executive, before we, no, it wasn't executive session, it was uh, Board of Liquor Control that we meant to recess and not adjourn. On line 191, page five. If we adjourned, we wouldn't have been able to come back. I'll move if the uh, consent calendar be approved with those few changes. Second. <clears throat> Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Stained. Motion carries. 
Next up is in the business items, consider adopting a validation resolution. Yep, uh, we, back in 18, there was a bond vote seeking authorization to borrow a one and a half million for the North Wells and Reservoir project. As we were going through submittal of the step three funding application, which is to get the money for construction, you notice we were missing a few different process elements. So two of those were pretty easily taken care of. Um, the third is a letter from bond council. It's pretty standard when you, you borrow and one of these certifies that we went through all of the statutory process and the other requirements the way, um, the way that we were supposed to. <coughs> and looking through the other documents, there's a, there are four locations listed for which notice of the bond vote was posted. Statute wants you to have five. So the easiest way to, to clean this up is through something called a validation resolution where we essentially say, we've had no rescission vote. We went through a lengthy process. We tried to notice this in every way that we were required to. Voters approved it. Um, so we're certifying that this is, in fact, you know, the will of the town of Randolph, and we're authorized to borrow the $1.5 million. Um, trying to find whether or not a fifth location was used to post four years ago um, is a detective challenge beyond their capability. So we went with, this is sort of the easiest option once you do this, presuming you do. Bond Council can finalize its letter. The application's already in, so this is just kind of appending it to that. So it's not holding that up, but it would be helpful. That'll complete the, complete the set. And then the Bond Council folks we've used before drafted the resolution, so that's where that language comes from. I'll move that we approve the validation resolution for the 2018 bond vote. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stain. Motion carries. So, update on the North Wells and Reservoir Project. Not too much to report beyond what's written. We are, um, as is mentioned here, we touched on it briefly, I think in April, we did open, we had the bond, uh, the bid opening. There was one bidder, Kingsbury Construction, out of primarily Waitsfield. Um, it was close to $3 million. We had at one point thought this was 1.7, then it went to 1.9. We had 2.25 million in available resources, thinking we were safe there. Um, so as you can see, we're about $750,000 beyond. Um, what those resources were lined up to be, meaning that, and it's probably going to stay at this price or get more expensive is what everybody's thinking. So what this means is we have to figure out how to pay for that. So we have looked into, um, there's a potential that we can get some additional disadvantaged subsidy through the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. The challenge there is that the cycles don't kind of match up to where we are now. We have to wait to get into the next, what they call intended use plan. If we can get in there and we're eligible, that would be how to do that. It just queues up for a later construction season if that's it. We have to touch base with Northern Borders and VCDP on additional funding. We've begun that outreach. We've got a request into the Northern Borders folks and we'll follow up with VCDP on that. Also had an opportunity right when all of this happened. We were a couple of days before a deadline for Senator Sanders' office had a congressionally directed spending window that was open. This looks to be an eligible project. So we had all the information from that step three application, so we were able to put that in um, for the 750. That would require us to come up with a match of 150. We do have that in, a, in the water improvement reserve. So when you just think of it in terms of the simplest resources on hand style uh, equation, we could meet that, but that's obviously less than certain in terms of there's a lot of competing interest for that. So we're trying to figure out what that looks like there was a narrow band of hope that we might be able to start later in the construction season this year, so it's closer to fall and be completed. Um, it's a relatively simple site. I mean, there's no traffic control, and there's some site control, some stormwater. I mean, it's fairly isolated, tucked away. You can secure it, work within it, have few sort of delays or variables. <coughs> but it's looking more likely that it'll be next year. So um, we'll keep sort of twisting that Rubik's Cube on that, but we should be able to find that funding queue up at a minimum, worst case scenario, it might be if we can't find ways to fill the gap through other means, grant fund, SRF subsidies, uh, congressional earmarks, um, whatever it might be, then there is the opportunity to go to the voters. There's the November election, which is going to have a big turnout, and then we, again in May that we could say direct appropriation, we need more authorization, whatever it is. So we have a few different ways to maybe get there if we're on that longer cycle. Um, 
So we're still moving forward. Everything's queued up. We got the construction permit today, actually, it came via email. So we're good through 2024 in terms of the validity of that. So permitting-wise, we're lined up. Funding applications are in. It's just the one bid, the shortfall. And the timing was always going to be a little dicey anyway. And that was part of the feedback. So it lets us bid out a little bit earlier. Maybe we can increase the number. Maybe that helps the price. There isn't a lot of value engineering with this project because it's pretty simple. I mean, it's a tank, three wells, and a new pump building, and a fence around it. So there aren't a lot of bells and whistles you can you can go after as, as ways to eliminate them. But we'll take another look to, to see. But um, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. The tank's already smaller than the one that's there um, for, for a variety of logistical reasons. So I wanted to make sure we touched base. That was kind of our big planned project for the summer. And it looks like it's our big planned project for the following summer. Were there any changes? Questions? Were there any changes along the way, or was that doubling the price just basic? I think it was the time element. I mean, you figure we went to the voters in 2018, and then projects have their own sort of life cycles. This one was a little bit longer. You've got four years of pandemic, supply chain issues, labor issues suddenly that you didn't have maybe in 18, 19, um, plus just the passage of time. So that all, I think, contributed to that. So there are material costs, um, and some of them it's because there's been so much volatility and variability in them. It's hard to say, here's an estimate we feel comfortable with as a contractor for this item when we don't know what fuel costs are going to be. We don't know if we're going to have enough people to do the job. And if we can get pipe, what's it, you know, what's it going to cost? What's conduit going to cost if we can get it? So you have to be conservative, so the numbers are probably a little on that higher end just to account for the fact that there's no real good way to. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so they're just trying to, they're trying to protect themselves and add in a bit of a buffer. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, we heard that feedback. There was another entity that was interested, followed the process, came to the bid bidding, but uh, the bid opening, but never submitted a bid. And the feedback was similar in terms of they were within, I forget what it was, within $100,000, dollars one side or the other. Um, but same concerns about material costs. How do you? How do you estimate those? Do you have enough labor? Can you do it on the schedule? Um, so maybe with a longer runway, if we can hold the line and do it next summer, that that's an absolute win, I think. So. Mm -hmm. so. Will we have to rebid? Yeah. Well, we'll likely have to rebid unless the money shows up suddenly and we can still link it. We're still in the initial window for the bid to be good, but we're we're running out. I think we've got another two weeks. Before that <coughs> we'll say it's that first week of June. We won't, we won't have problems maintaining our existing grant funding, you don't think? Shouldn't, based on a conversation in February, it was one of those where if you run into issues knowing all the volatility, reach out to us. So part of the request for to see if there's any additional grant funding is to say, hey, if we're into next summer, it's less with the VCDP. So we've got two grants. It's the 450000 from Northern Borders and three hundred from Community Development Program. For the $300,000, is less of a concern from a timeline. It's the northern borders money that had an, an end of October deadline for use in 2022. So that's the one we'll have to make sure. We've started communicating. We had that conversation in February to say, you know, where they said, hey, if you get into a jam, let us know sooner than later. So we'll look to amend that and push it out by a year would be the idea. And then the SRF money is. You know, we're, we're in the pipeline, we're in the intended use plan, we're, we're kind of queued up and on and that's track. A, that's loan money, though. But that's a loan, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then the other potential sources of information of our funding, what we'll, went through with sort of a sense of them, we'll know about those? Yeah, we'll, we'll know on, um, we'll know the grant question sooner than later. I think once we've close that loop, we should be able to get an estimate on what disadvantage subsidy money there could be that could be applied and how that would work, you know, grants versus is it incorporated in a loan. I don't know all the mechanics in terms of if there's a, a, a piece there that gets incorporated. The congressionally directed spending request we'll know within the next, you know, couple of months probably. Um, they've been talking to us, asking clarifying questions, so we've at least been in the running for a little bit. Um, and then once we sort of line that up, we can start to explore some of those other options in terms of where do we need to go, 
what's the gap, um, and should we essentially bake in our own contingency on top of that. Um, what's kind of nice about the, the congressionally directed spending request is you've got to match it. So if you had to match it with the 150, that probably accounts for what's going to be the additional lost season increase would be the hope. Um, in terms of increased cost. Yeah. yeah. And then I, one of the thought was um, these contractors who are trying to protect themselves given the volatility in prices, um, is it possible to write a, a, a contract that says basically specify some of these items which are particularly of concern, mm -hmm. and then they could say, you know, in their proposal what they expect those things to cost, and then if they come in under those, you know, if their costs for those things come in less, that we could then, you know, get you know, that reflected in our final price. You're talking about like a percentage cap on? Not, not necessarily a cap, but if they're saying like, it's going to cost us this much money for the pipe we need. You know, we, we, well, or we, we don't know what it's going to cost, but we think it's going to be between $100,000 and $200,000. We don't really know where, so we're going to, in our proposal, make it $200,000 just so that we don't sell ourselves short. Right. But then when they actually go to buy it, it's $150,000. Can we write it into the contract that they have to tell us what they actually spent for it and refund us the difference? Um, so Larry, there's two that cuts both ways. So you're going to be ready to pay the additional if the bid comes in higher. Right. And the way you usually do that is you do materials plus percentage. Mm -hmm. So they order the materials and can get a certain percentage above them. Uh -huh. uh, some contractors, when you set your pricing, um, a portion of their overhead is, is, comes from the materials. The more materials you need in a job, the higher the cost to to complete the job usually so sure I, yeah, they no, might that, put materials plus 10 percent say in the contract and then and then if the market whichever way the market goes you share if it comes in lower but it might cost you if it comes in higher right right and i guess that's something that we could we could think about it just <laughs> seems like under normal under normal circumstances yes you would expect you know they 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 get a you know a certain they make a certain amount of money on the materials and that's that's sort of normal course of business um just seems like with this extreme volatility that if they're really pegging their price at what they think their their maximum is that maybe there's some room there for us to to do something like that but if yeah if we think that the price that they're giving us is that it could actually be more than that then we would be taking on that risk I guess it just depends upon how much they're trying to protect themselves, um, given given the scenario. I can tell you, in a lot of cases, uh, pricing is only good for three days. Right now, it's uh, it's crazy. But when we get estimates from the lumber yard on materials, they hold it for three. Days. You're breaking up, Trini. When we get the estimates right now, we're only they're only being held for three days. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's volatility. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Thanks. All right. Any other questions on that project? Are we ready to go on to the dump truck order? All the exciting stuff tonight. Oh, no. <laughs> so that we actually passed this one for you. This is the nuts and bolts of town government. That's, That's right. right. So the capital improvement plan calls for us to buy to replace one of our tandem dump dump trucks. So one of the big ones. Um, this one is a 2013 Freightliner. Um, so it's getting close to the end of, of its high end useful life, close to that that two years. So we've got two different prices. Um, for you to consider, we had anticipated in the capital improvement program that we would spend about $184,000 out of the highway reserve for these types of purchases. So in both cases, we'd actually be a little bit under that um, in terms of the total outcome. And part of that is trade-in value. This is where this volatility of the market and brave new world has actually worked in our favor. 
Um, and we're hearing now for ATG Viking, the second one, we've got a guaranteed fifty-five thousand dollars on the trade-in price there, and it could be as much as sixty if we were able to resell it sooner uh, on that. So there's the potential to, to even lower some of the presume cost by another five to ten thousand, certainly by five, or possibly up to ten thousand from there. So that leaves more money for us to apply to future purchases, so we can replace trucks on a different schedule. And one of the things we're trying to do with this. The bid price that we're recommending, which is the ATG Viking combination, um, that would net out to about $140,000 for that updated um, trade-in value, also includes a seven-year warranty on the components, particularly the electrical components. We're finding that right around year five, that's when those things really start to, to fail, um, and they're harder to repair, um, replace, can affect performance. So all of these things will be covered. And then by, if we can get onto a slightly shorter cycle, we can gain even a little more um, back in trade in value. So um, the other big factor was, it's the type of truck we wanted a freight liner that's what we expect out the other supplier because of supply chain and other issues. Uh, the Western Star, so it's a slightly more expensive truck, but that was the one they could deliver within a certain timeline. Um, whereas the, the recommended bid has that freight liner that we're used to. What's different is the bodybuilder is one that we haven't used in a while. We've had Viking build bodies at the last two stops I've had. The truck bodies more or less work the way you hope they will. There, there are things probably for Reg that he could point out to you um, as the mechanic is going to fix whatever happens. But um, they, they've worked well in those other applications. And, and then, so delivery date was a big one. The, the more expensive one would have been at least a year out from now if we ordered it today, um, possibly longer. If we order the recommended bid, we can have that truck in town in November, toward the beginning of November. So we've got a frontline plow truck in service for when the snow starts to fly. Although given the way the weather's been lately, probably could have used it earlier this week. Um, and, and maybe in two weeks, who knows at this rate. But um, So we're recommending it's the ATG Viking truck. It'll net out to be about $140,000 for that trade-in value. That's paid from, from the capital reserve for these types of highway equipment purchases. Um, and so we've had a, knock on wood, on jinx, we've had a good run with, between this, um, the sidewalk plow, um, some of the equipment we've gone out to get has been less than what we're expecting to pay, which is gonna leave more money for us to, to deploy uh, next year and beyond without looking for new dollars, um, maybe either at all or in the same way. So it was, it's good news. It's nuts and bolts, but good news. Great. Does this come with a cover on the back? Uh, I don't know that, that level of, well, that's something that we would install later, have one of, if it's part of that build. Might be worth checking, maybe yeah. cheaper. Again, I'll send John a note to see. But. Do you want the answer to that, Pat, before we vote? No, I, I think we ought to consider it. Yeah, I'll let you know it comes in across the line, but I don't think they do generally as a standard piece, though. I don't, I don't remember one being included, but I've got the request in, so John will know the specs. I'll move that we um, approve the tandem truck, truck order as um, indicated by Trevor. I'll second. All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, mowing bids. So we've got the one for you to consider here. Um, this is as the write up states, we are, um, as we triage the various vacancies across departments, one of the ones that we're unable to cover. In a normal year, um, based on how we're built, the building and grounds department should have um, five employees available to it to cover mowing of the cemeteries, the recreation field. That's not counting the seasonal. Um, that's at the recreation 
uh, recreation facility full time, um, and the, the other town properties such as here, the various little islands and places around town. We are down to one full time employee plus the seasonal um, as we try to fill some of these in. And um, as we lost one of the other employees, I can explain that to you later, but essentially they, um, the ability to work was was uh, was something that they, they weren't able to retain, um, you know, one of the, 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 the job requirements. Um, so what we're trying to do to fill the hole, the two that make the most sense to contract out from a semi-paid <coughs> mowing perspective are East Randolph and Randolph Center, in that they're um, a little farther away from the other properties that the smaller mowing crew could then handle. Um, we're still working on some of the staffing pieces, so we <coughs> may not need that second contract, we've been contracting some of that work out kind of on a weekly basis as it is. Um, so we may come back to you for that one, but I don't have that answer right now. Those things are getting mowed, those parcels are getting mowed, so it's not like it's un untended. Um, so we had one bid, we did a, we tried to follow the purchasing policy, <coughs> certainly in intent, we couldn't hit all the timelines just because when we sort of found out about our sort of full shortfall and mowing season had already begun, so how many weeks behind did we want to be? We did sort of a modified RFP process. We put one together, you know, had the full, here's what we expect. Please bid it out as if you're going to mow weekly from about this time until the end of October. These amounts might be less because as the grass slows down, we won't need that regular uh, a cycle. Um, but we sort of tried to give you the, the worst case scenario here. Um, and so and we called a couple of people, we had people stop in, so in addition to just putting it out there, tried to at least get um, a couple of different numbers for you to look at. What we got back, similar to the water project, was a single number from a single bidder, uh, a local contractor named Seth Fernandez. I've broken down those costs for you here um, and tried to break them down because the mowing season will span the two fiscal years, so we'll see some of these show up in fiscal 22, some, some will show up in fiscal 23. At this point, I'm anticipating this is just a one year only, um, how do we keep the boat on the water kind of a move. Um, and the grass is already getting pretty long um, with Memorial Day approaching. Um, so you can see it breaks down. The total between the two cemeteries is about $34,000, I think. A little more than what it was contract out before at. I don't think it's that far off. I saw that number, I just didn't, I should have written it down. Um, and that's if we do every week from now until the until Halloween, basically, or, or, or pretty close to it. Um, and so they'll handle all of the mowing. The burials, the uh, cemetery folks, I think through Fumarum have taken on most of that digging. Where we'll have issues will be in Randolph Center. We may have to divert other town resources. There's so much ledge up in that cemetery so that whether it's in, you know, an urn interment or a, a, a full, a full size, um, often we have to have a jackhammer and sometimes it involves using that jackhammer for nearly the entirety of the of the process. And so you hammer it out, you scoop up the pieces, you hammer it out, scoop up the pieces. So we have to, we have specific employees that can um, handle the jackhammer. Um, and, and so we'll look to, to use those. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is where we are. Um, and so what? Well, the assistant zoning administrator? <laughs> I, I, well, I have Doug Graves. I do have that in my, in my resume. Oh, the the jackhammer it. would be a new one for me. Talk well. about other duties that yeah. are. Huh? I'm game. It's new piece of equipment. Um, yeah, it's but, uh, interesting. That could be a messy result. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're recommending this is what we have before us. He's licensed. He's got these insured, he's got his own equipment. Um, we do all that and can start as early as, as next week and get us rolling. The way we'll pay for this is that I mentioned, so the way that department's structured right now in terms of employees, you have a supervisor, which was Harold's role. Um, there were the two hybrid pieces, so those were about half the year and they were shared, they're shared with highway. And then you have two sort of general laborers. So that's Mark White, who's our remaining employee, who I do want to call out for doing um, above and beyond uh, and, and trying to take more things on and, and that's certainly <coughs> appreciated. Um, and then the other one had been, is currently vacant. And is the one that, that opened uh, recently. Um, and so we're, essentially what we're going to be able to do is take the vacancy savings from that position, um, from salary and benefits, it'll more than cover this. It does mean that we'll probably not fill that position um, through most of the year. So it may have um, some ripple effects in that we'll have to figure out how to do sidewalks a little differently than we have. However, we spent last winter 
for different other reasons of availability, running out a different way to do sidewalks. So we may have already solved that particular conundrum through necessity this past winter. Um, so we'll essentially trade that you know, one for the other. And then if we have to do additional mowing, there'll be some vacancy savings in there that, that we'll look to tap first, really from the pay and the benefit side. And, and just sort of give a rough outline, it should, it should cover half. Um, if we had to do sort of the most extreme models, and the grass never stops growing until Halloween. In terms of spraying the each time they mow it? Yeah, this is a yeah a, a per mow, essentially a per week. So we took the total number of weeks um, that were in the bid and kind of multiplied them. We're actually starting a, a week later than because of the way the beating got pushed back. So mm -hmm. this is minus seven hundred and fifty or whatever it worked out to be for the two. Um, I was thinking more at the end when it might be dry or not. Or yeah, not. well, we can maybe or if we have yeah, dry conditions in July, you know, some some summers grass. Burn and stops. Um, if any other questions on the mowing contract? <clears throat> if not, any motions? I'll move the approval of the mowing contract. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is appointments to the Planning Commission. We have two applicants. I think I saw Sunny still on. Um, so we have two applicants. We've got Sheila Jacobs and Eileen London have both applied. Sheila's attended a Planning Commission meeting and comes with their reference, I understand. And Sunny has met with Eileen London and, and can maybe tell you more about where the PC is on that. But it seems as if both candidates are recommended. We have two seats available, so we'd have a full planning commission for the first time, uh, I think, <coughs> at least in a year. I'm not, I'm not sure we've been there, and it might even be longer than that. There are two four-year terms that are open. One expires 2025, the other 2026, so you'd be appointing one to the remainder of the unexpired term for 25, and the other, if you so choose, I should say, um, to the unexpired term for 2026. And this might help with some of the quorum issues they've had. That's been mm -hmm. one of the challenges here in, in recent months. I, I think Sonny, can, if I'm not mistaken. Sonny, so anybody they... here know Eileen? Um, she's only been here, according to her letter of interest, she's only been here since December of 2021, but um, her letter also reflects the substantial amount of experience in project development management and uh, those kinds of things and she has an MA in um, public administration from BU so she's she's definitely got the academic and professional chops to bring to the table <clears throat> if I could speak to both of them uh, they're, they're outstanding candidates and strongly endorse them uh, Eileen London, she's from uh, Randolph Center, and her background is in environmental affairs and also urban affairs, so she'll bring strength to the Planning Commission. Uh, Sheila Jacobs uh, was a member of the Randolph Budget Committee for a number of years, uh, a strong uh, candidate. Uh, I think they both bring uh, wealth to the Planning Commission. I, I would recommend Sheila Jacobs for the, uh, the 2025 position and uh, Eileen London for the 2026 position. Anybody have any questions on that? I'll make that motion that they both be approved to those two terms. And I will second. Motion and a second on the table. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stained motion carries. East Randolph Tanker. The idea was to have at least a preliminary conversation about the, the replacement of the tanker truck that's in East Randolph. This is the truck that appears in the capital improvement program for the next fiscal year, so fiscal 23, starting July 1. 
um, we put some money aside for that to be replaced from the, the um, I think it's just called the fire equipment reserve that covers the vehicles or parts of them and, and other more expensive equipment they may have. Um, and so we were anticipating that was going to be around $300,000 what we put in there based on um, some rough estimates and some other uh, sort of, I don't call them guesses, but we were pulling from some other sources um, as opposed to having a specific truck, you know, spec'd out and costed out as we might normally do if we were a little um, more certain about the replacement. Some of this was to make sure it was in there, that there was a marker held. <coughs> And to allow for some time for some other conversation to happen on, on and to conclude on fire equipment generally. Um, this truck, you can see there's a listing on page six of the manager report that we took from the insurance listing. All of the, the fleet vehicles um, for the three fire departments. Um, this is the oldest of those vehicles. This is a 1988, so we're well beyond kind of 20 year useful life. I think finding drivers for it's even a challenge. This is a manual transmission, if I'm not mm. mistaken. And wow. um, that's an increasingly lost skill, it seems. Um, and so it limits the number of drivers in addition to um, some of the other operational concerns they have. About 60% of these vehicles are more than 20 years old. So we're, we're certainly, this is the um, kind of the snake that swallowed the woodchuck kind of a moment um, in terms of how they've all come due. Um, or, or will shortly. So the idea was just to kind of start a conversation. Um, Kevin Taylor, the chief out there, has been considering different options both recently and through the years from different types of trucks to, to um, used trucks. At one point, I think he found one in Canada a couple of years ago, for example. Um, um, and so there's you know, different ways of, of, of twisting the problem around to see how to solve it. Um, and I think the idea was to have an initial conversation about where where we're at and, and maybe where we want to go and if we want to talk equipment generally. I don't know if I've missed anything, Trini, because I think you, you had a conversation with Kevin as well. Yeah, we did. Um, so even if they were to transfer um, one of the trucks down from Randolph Center that's there, that's outdated already also. That's a 97. So um, no matter what we end up deciding on firefighting fleet, uh, those two trucks both are outdated. Um, and the challenge we have right now is the truck that East Randolph has is not making it to the scene. <clears throat> so uh, Kevin has looked at a few, he's got a spec that he's working on, but at the same time, he went out and checked on the market to see if there were any good used ones out there, but also to see if some of these entities were getting in any tankers that um, could be used for that. He does have a lead on one that's coming in uh, sometime in the next few months. Um, it's what they're looking for is something very similar to the milk trucks that you see out there. They're not looking for anything fancy or anything with a whole lot of storage or extra cab space, but literally something that will just haul water to the scene. So I think the, the request and what they're looking for, they've narrowed it right down to the, the minimum of what it will take to do the job. And the request tonight is to give them approval to go ahead and spec it um, and locate one to bring back to the board to, for approval to purchase. But before we have a volunteer spend hours out doing this work, wanted to make sure the board was behind the, the purchase. Trini, I thought we were waiting until the committee report before we made a decision on equipment. Is that not, does that change? Or have we got more information? <coughs> um, I don't know that we can wait until the committee gets done because the committee hasn't been back together. We don't have the building assessments completed by the departments on some of the structures that had to get done to know what our risk <coughs> is out there. But I think this one is a pretty safe decision. If you look at the age of the fleet, um, your firefighting equipment is good for 20 years. There's a fair number of them on that list that are more than 20 years old. Um, you know, you can get away with an older truck 
uh, the tank and the other equipment that you're supposed to be keeping up updated. If you look at the fleet in East Randolph right now, all of it's outdated. And then, you know, you keep looking down through and, you know, you got two in Randolph Center, one in the village that are in that category too. So I don't know that any discussion with that committee or where we're going to land is going to change the fact that we need to replace one of these tankers. I think when you think of fleet mix too, and you think of East Randolph and that application, some kind of pumper tanker um, where you're out there, more rural, rural environment, um, carrying water, the ability to carry water, the ability to pump water, because you're not going to be able to connect to the system really that the village would in terms of this being a safe bet in terms of if there is some future um, you know metric by which this department has these vehicles this one has these vehicles and, and this one has this type of vehicles this is probably a pretty safe match for what you're going to want or need in, in East Randolph just by nature of, of that type of firefighting as opposed to here we have hydrants and other things that may, and maybe change the, the map a little bit I could Talking out my ear a little bit, but I think it seems like a safe, a safe bet, all things considered. Yeah. Yeah, sounds like you're saying this is something we need anyway, no matter what the final decision is. A 1988 fire truck makes me nervous from a variety of perspectives, from the ability to roll to a call to how safe it will be on the call to. And we have anticipated spending up to three hundred thousand dollars in in that approved budget and capital plan. So we we are thinking about it. We just does it fit with this larger conversation, or does it have to go you know, before that's concluded? And I think we're probably at the moment where it's it has to go before the other conversations concluded, really. This truck that they're asking to replace is the one that actually has not made it to the fires. It's been towed out of Route 14 a few times. Whoa. I will move that we authorize uh, uh, the going ahead with the exploration of replacing the uh, international pumper tanker. Uh, with the understanding that it'll be brought back to us for further action. The second thought. A motion and a second on the table. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Dane, motion carries. Letter of support for the school district. So we have Heather Lawler here with us tonight. And She's here to answer questions, maybe present a little bit about the request, what the grant is. We included some of this information in packets, but it might be good to sort of hear what the request <coughs> is and, and what the grant's intended for and see where you are at that point. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, going to be the assistant superintendent of the Orange Southwest School District uh, starting in July. And um, in the May 5th, edition of the Herald, I came across this little tiny piece right there that said that there were $10,000 grants available from the Vermont Community Foundation um, to support um, programming on equity and inclusion. And it's a tiny little piece and I clipped it and I thought, I bet we could do something with that. So I researched it. I have a little handout I could give you on like the programs we're considering. Would that be helpful? Sure. Possibly? Okay. Just one. Yep. Thank you. Um, and so the thing with this grant is it's really written for towns. Like the way the grant is written is a town is supposed to like uh, do this community programming. And however, um, any nonprofit <coughs> or other community group, such as a school district or any other nonprofit, Chandler or anyone else, with your support, could pursue this funding. And it, what we need would need is a letter of, of support. So we are considering um, programming that would involve not only students but the entire community, welcoming in the community, um, both 
the idea of consultant-led conversations to build empathy and consultant-led art programming to build empathy, um, to promote the idea of inclusion and equity. I um, have not spoken with Calvin yet. He's been recommended. I did have a wonderful meeting today with Safe Art. They are fabulous. Mm -hmm. I talked with her at length today. She has a vision for a project called Web of Many Voices that would include both students and adults in creating a community art installation. Um, it's just in the concept phase, but these are some visions we would have. And I didn't even want to start writing the grant proposal until I spoke with all of you. Because as the same other things you're talking about, it's a lot of work to even put in for a grant. And um, so the first thing I would need is your consideration of support. And I drafted a very brief sort of like letter of support. I, put on, I took the liberty of putting it on your agenda. <laughs> but it basically is three sentences and says, um, we are ready to support the OSSD application for the Equitable and Inclusive Communities Grant. We support their plan to use the grant funding to benefit the community members of the town of Randolph. The funding will provide a series of consultant-led community-wide conversations and other programming to promote <coughs> equity and inclusion. So it's not specific because I haven't applied for the grant yet or actually got contracts in place for people who would do the work if I get the grant. But I need your consideration um, as a town if this would benefit our community. In the, in the grant application that I've written many grant applications, so I kind of know how to, do you have to specify whether we may work with Calvin or with Tracy? They will want, they will want a proposal mm -hmm. of an organization. We recently got one at Braintree Elementary School where I currently am the principal for equity and we named the Clemens Family Farm as the organization of partnership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did get that $5,000 grant. So I, and I know from, from that experience that they might <coughs> offer for you to say, we want to work with Safe Art. Like I'm much more likely to get awarded a grant than if I just say, we want to work with some, someone, we have no idea who. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking to write the language that we could find other programming if it came up in a grassroots type of way. But the grant would be written that they would be open to for other, you know, mm -hmm. things that might benefit the community. And, and is Calvin from Vermont? Or? He was recommended to me by Lane Millington, our current superintendent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he has worked with him in the past, but no, he is not a local Vermonter. Okay. Whereas, so as you see, the other organization is. Yeah, Mary yeah. Chelsea, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have written a grant with. Tracy, so. Excellent. Uh, for Chandler. I who I been. spoke with today was Ornella. Do you know Ornella? I know who she is. Yeah, yeah. she was yeah. dynamic. Yeah. But Tracy presented um, mm -hmm. a dance work that Chandler hosted its world premiere a couple of years ago, and Tracy and I worked together on the grant to pull that together for Chandler. So, um, it does kind of give her a leg up that she has that local connection. <clears throat> Although it looks like Calvin's work is quite good too. And as I said, I reached out to both of them and I have gotten no response from Calvin, whereas Safe Art was highly responsive, booked a meeting with me. Um, we have planned for them to come out at least to Braintree and do sort of a sample lesson so we can get a feel for their work mm -hmm. before we would go district wide. So I agree with you. The local, you know, the local has more power and certainly more responsiveness. Mm -hmm. And so I had already made this, but if I hadn't, I would have put safer on top. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that sounds great. Sounds like a, a great idea. Thank you. Is there anything else you need from the town or is it just a At this time, just a, a note of support. And um, as I proceed with writing the grant, I'll let you know if there's anything further. But I did read through the grant page, and that's what they, they specifically asked for the exception. Nonprofit organizations or community groups may apply with a letter of support from the municipality. Yeah. Um, will we support the grant? 
application with a very positive, nice letter from Trevor. And supported by all the select board. Well second to Abby. <clears throat> a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Assembly permits for the New World Festival. <clears throat> This is the annual request for the public event permit for the New World Festival. These have all been sent to different public safety entities, and we did hear back from <coughs> Orange County. I don't have it in front of me. Orange County and, and Village Fire Department. I don't think there's any change in setup proposal. On first Friday, I did. The first Friday. Too much on the New World. Okay. I didn't hear back on that. So we haven't heard heard back. Uh, on that, um, but we'll keep after it. But it, this is the more or less the same event they've been doing yeah. for a while, and it seems to have worked without too much challenge. But Michael signed the first Fridays. He came yeah, in and signed that, that one. So, because there were some questions, and then <clears throat> based on answers to those questions, he came in and signed it. So that one is yeah. signed by Michael. Okay. The uh, the New World Festival application looks pretty straightforward and comparable to what they've done before for years. This is the 30th year and oh, wow. the layout, yeah, this is the 30th one. And the layout um, looks almost identical, so I can't imagine that. Using the DNK parking lot's different, right? What's that? They're using the DNK parking yes. lot for stage, yeah. that's the only difference? Right? Yeah, that's the only difference. And then a motion to approve, Tom? <laughs> uh, sure, I'll make a motion to approve. <laughs> Is that wonderful? Um, I'll make a motion if we want to combine them. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm very familiar Maybe with the first one. at a time. One at a time? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll move that we approve the uh, uh, application from uh, Chandler for this year's New World Festival. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion oh, carries. Um, the first Fridays. So Stephanie had to leave, but Peter Reed is here and and can talk to oh, uh, yeah, some of the specifics of what sure what they're stuff. proposing to do. Sure. I, I'm I'm glad to give you a quick overview if that helps. Hey there, Peter. <laughs> Um, so the, the first Friday event is something that uh, is, is really a, a bit of a grassroots effort from local merchants to try to promote a, you know, a few hours of, of fun downtown on a Friday evening. Uh, our intent is to um, do them every, every first Friday from June through October. Uh, and we're requesting that we be able to close Merchants Row from Main Street to um, Pleasant Street uh, between four and probably about eight thirty or nine in the evening, uh, we've our, our plan is basically to have food from the the local restaurants right there in the area. We're uh, exploring the need for a liquor permit to potentially be able to have the whole uh, Merchants Row area be uh, open to people carrying alcohol, uh, and we expect to have a band and a small tent with a stage to uh, provide some entertainment. So we have at this point, uh, I mean, we have a bunch of the local merchants participating already. We've talked to all the other ones uh, on Merchants Row. And uh, I, I would say everybody's you know, in favor. Uh, the, the Fisher Auto Parts uh, staff expressed some concern about parking for their, their uh, potential customers between four and five. And we've worked out with Luke Ward who owns Backstreet to reserve some parking spaces there for any any customers of any of the Merchant Row uh, businesses during that four to five period uh, to at least give them a, a little a little option to be able to, to park right around the corner. So that's, uh, that's the basic story at this point. Uh, we, you know, again, this is sort of a, an effort cooperating with all the different uh, 
merchants to to offer something that's that kind of focuses on our downtown and we hope it might expand a little bit out from there with the new art store and gallery that's going to be up the street and uh, we're we're basically contacting all the restaurants in the area to see if they want to offer any sort of specials or something they may want to do afterwards there'll be a bike ride a running event so it's it's going to be a lot of different things coming together uh, and we hope it won't be too disruptive and will be entertaining and build a little business cohesiveness in our downtown. Uh, I, I should say that RACDC is is sponsoring this from a sort of entity perspective, uh, but really we're just providing a little bit of organization and the insurance cover and uh, being being a little bit of a, a coordinating effort. But really, it's it's the individual businesses themselves that will be doing whatever they wish to do. Peter, one of the concerns I've heard is the access for the part store. And we hear this every time we go to change uh, access through Merchants Row. Um, and they're worried about obviously getting customers for that last hour or plus, you know, until they close from four to when they close. Um, how, are, how are people going to find out that they can't be on Merchants Row and they have to park over and around back? And that the business is even still open. Well, our, our intent is to, I mean, once if, if we're putting some sort of cordon across the, the street, um, it will be obvious that it's closed, but we intend to have some some signage there that says Merchants Row businesses parking available on Back Street. Um, and we'll we'll try to police those spaces to make sure that that other people are not parking them. Um, so that was that was the the plan. I, I went personally and discussed with Jason at the the parts store what our our plan was, and uh, you know he, he expressed the same concerns to me. And we, we're trying to do whatever we can to alleviate that problem for that that last hour. So I would think a case could be made that this might actually bring more business to them in a way, right? Um, in that people that are planning on attending. First Friday and need new windshield wiper blades, right? Um, <laughs> you know, combine it into one trip. Uh, so, I don't think it's going to drive business to them. I think what they're worried about is the people on their way home that were going to swing in there and pick up parts. How are they going to know that they can't drive down Merchants Row Park, run in and grab them, and come back out until they're at the end of Merchants Row and can't go? Right. At which point now you've got to, depending which way you're coming in, you got quite a, you know, you got to go down and if you're headed uh, out of town, you got to circle around or you got to go railroad street and, and back down around. But in the past, we haven't allowed it until the businesses were closed, which I think for them would be five o'clock. Right. They, they close at five. They, they confirm that to me. So, uh, yeah, it would I, I I don't I don't dispute that it would be a, a somewhat of a, an inconvenience to them, but um, my uh, you know I, I don't I don't know their business very well. My understanding is they're they're predominantly a uh, a call in and we deliver type of service, but uh, I I don't want to you know downplay the fact that that there will be a, an hour of disruption at the end of Friday. If the signage is sufficiently prominent at uh, at the end of Merchants Row, the parking is right there, at least from that from that one end, right? So, uh, what is the benefit? What is the difference between you guys starting your event at four and starting it at five? Well, we're we're our aim is to make this uh, somewhat family friendly and basically happened during the daylight hours. Um, so that was our, our goal to try to aim for five o'clock where, where people might be still you know coming from work or still in the area and uh, trying to, to make it kind of a, uh, an end of the day thing that, uh, but the, the, the four o'clock is really to be able to set up the, the stage and tent. We're, we're working on uh, 
you know, how fast we can do that, but we haven't, we haven't tried it yet. But I, I, I would say they're, they're the only business that objects. I don't, not that that, again, uh, should make a difference, but, but it is just the, the one business there. And the most of the rest of them are restaurants that are going to be part of it. Right. So, you I mean, know, they they're could, the only they, ones I expect to. I mean, they could participate in some way if they wanted. I mean, we have a few other businesses that are not restaurants that are participating. Um, but, but again, it's, it's not necessarily a natural uh, fit to have a, a downtown event and have that, how, how does that fit with auto parts? <laughs> given the, the limited nature of the amount of time that, that you're asking for and, and given the fact that there are, is alternative parking, even though it might not completely alleviate their concerns, I, I feel like this is a reasonable plan. Could we, Peter, could we approve the first date and then if that goes way wrong or something, we should reconsider because you're asking for five dates, right? Right, I, I would be fine with that to, to see, I mean, there, this is a new thing we're doing. I mean, we've done other events down there in the past, but uh, I'd be fine with, with approving this, see how it goes. If there's, if there's significant pushback, we're glad to modify as we go forward. Well, you you're gonna have to come back anyway to get the liquor license right would you would you like a motion screening sure um, first of all I'm on the RACDC board um, just to state that I move that we approve the first date um, as <coughs> applied for, and then our CDC will have to come back for the rest of the dates. Second that. Is a motion in favor? Second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stained? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Hope, hope to see you all there. Thanks, Peter. See you there. Next up is other business. I don't have any for you. Go into the manager's report. We did verify that a tarp system is included in the new truck. Um, so that will be part of that. Uh, beyond what you see listed there, um, we've posted uh, additional duties. The rec director's job has been posted in a variety of sites out there with the staff accountant and the economic development director and the two hybrids. Uh, and we'll keep augmenting that. There are two more now to add between the building and the ground supervisor. We're just waiting to, to see whether or not we can, um, if there are different ways to, to solve that one, such as re, re approaching one of the employees uh, about a potential return. Um, so we are uh, still working through that. I, I've remarked a couple of times that I, I do think we should all collectively prepare ourselves a little bit for this to be a bit of a siege um, rather than a short-term inconvenience. This is an unusual labor market. Um, the early returns on the things that have been posted for more than a couple of weeks have not um, you, know, you, you have to sort of round up with some of the candidate capabilities and experiences um, for the jobs we have. It doesn't mean they wouldn't be maybe good in other roles or, or, or for other positions, but, um, and so we may be in sort of a rolling triage system for a bit of time where we look for contract help, we look to extend contract help. Um, there may be certain things that we have to say <coughs> effectively. We, aren't doing this or we're doing less of this. Um, one of the ideas we may want to consider is we're finding already that we're really short in this building on bodies on Fridays. Um, the last Friday, Jim and I ended up being sort of front desk capacity at different points. Um, Friday a little bit too when she was in. 
Um, so we may want to take a page out of our COVID protocols and have that be kind of a close to the public appointment, use the drop boxes, and that might be a good way for folks to catch up um, <coughs> relatively unimpeded while maintaining a level of service more broadly. Um, so we'll, we'll look to some of those ideas. The clerk's office is kind of doing that now with Emory's impending, um, it's Emory UE and Ms. Ann sort of trying to make sure she stays, catches up, stays up the land records. That was one day we were able to sort of keep that office staffed pretty regularly um, for, for that time um, and, and get things done. So I, I, we are working through some of these things, but it's going to be a little different for a bit um, as we try to, to figure out. I, I, I mean, we are in the normal places for the economic development director. I reached out to people I know at the community development and applied economics department at UVM for graduate students, undergraduate students, anybody who's you know, presumably has an interest in that is through that program for the community development or the public administration pieces. Um, so we're even going with that angle. I started cruising the other municipalities' websites today um, with the intent to cannibalize uh, severely. Yeah, um, and that's sort of a new mode. Of, that's a new mode of conduct that does not fit the old chivalrous code. Um, but but we ha having been cannibalized um, a couple of times, we may have to look to see who's out there and who's maybe ready for a new role um, and, and has some experience and capability. So we'll, we'll keep at it. Um, I have seen more than enough of the different advanced management systems. Um, I don't see them again, it'll be okay, but we've got a long road to thankfully know how to navigate them. So, so we are out there, we're doing that. We do have those headwinds, though, of the labor market, um, a number of positions, um, where we are geographically, uh, just in terms of kind of in the in-between with gas prices of four, what I buy the other day, 465, 470 gallon. Um, we'll, we'll try to be creative, but, but it could be um, a little bit tight. I had mentioned that Mark had stepped up and had taken over some, some projects in between. I also wanted to acknowledge that Heidi had done that with some of the pool pieces, pool ramp, People have sort of stepped up, even ones that, that maybe have an end date out there as well. And so those efforts are pretty appreciated. Um, sent you the bread loaf report for the East Valley Community Hall earlier today. Um, at some point, I think that group wants to come and talk to you. I don't know if that's good or without the architect. Um, it's a fairly ex expensive <laughs> proposition based on that estimate. It's gonna be interesting to see what comes next. Ted Brady, who's the executive director of VLCP, has asked to come hang out with you for an evening, um, or for at least part of an evening at one of your meetings, so we'll set him up for the June 9th meeting, um, is what we're thinking. He wants to just come introduce himself. For those who don't know him, I think a couple of you do, he said, um, from his previous uh, um, tenures with both state government and with Land Use with Senator Leahy for a while in U.S. EA, maybe, for a piece. Um, Wasn't he with Commerce and Economic Development? Yeah, most, most recently there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I lived in Lewiston, we were also part of the same drop-off cycle for preschool, so I got to see him most mornings. Um, so what, what were you just talking to us about? Just sort of talking about where the league's at, what they're looking to do to getting feedback on how they can be um, helpful to, to us particularly, but local government generally, to a little bit of sort of uh, what did the legislative session entail from a municipal perspective. Um, some of those just sort of different. This is part, of, I think, of an effort where he's trying to get out and, and meet with as many communities as possible in, in a period of time. Maura Collins, or I mean, uh, Maura Carroll, sorry, Maura, um, who was in that role before Ted did a similar thing at the beginning of the tenure. Um, and if you just try to give it, give a little taste on it, get some feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we'll set that up. And then we had, we were able to get um, both Two Rivers and um, someone from the bigger <coughs> Management um, section at the Environmental Conservation Department to come out this week, and they both um, looked at, among other places, Lower Stock Farm Road, where the rivers got that nice oxbow that is encroaching steadily on the road, and also the North Randolph Road project that we had maybe thought would be a scoping study and headed down that grant route. Um, we're waiting for an email from them that lays out some of those options for Lower Stock Farm Road. Um, 
there isn't a quick one or a good one necessarily in terms of, of what they're comfortable with. One of the ideas was to maybe to try to uh, encourage the river to, to narrow that oxbow, but that seems like it um, may not be an option, so then we might be back to some sort of level or layer of armoring, so they'll send us what's okay, potential funding sources for that, so just something to keep in mind for, for later. And then with North Randolph Road, what we were able to, to actually go all the way through is we've got, um, we pitched them an idea where we remove the guardrail at the piece that's um, the road in, so the road's been narrowed to one lane. Um, we'll build essentially a little access road down to it and be able to sort of stabilize that bank with various sizes of rock about and then be able to reset the guardrails and reopen the, the road as a two lane. There may be state monies that are available for some or all of it, such as the materials in the excavator with our <coughs> capability. This was the highway department, John, helped come up with this idea. Um, worked on a little bit with Rita from Two Rivers, pitched it to the DEC folks, and they even issued an emergency stream alteration permit. Um, so we can forego the scoping study that says, what are we going to do, including consider closure and take those same funds from the stormwater reserve and apply them to the fix is the idea. Um, so that all happened earlier this week. That was the other big piece. Another two two areas that we do occasionally, mostly lower stock ground, I think is a little more visible um, in that section of Randolph Road, but we do hear about both both pieces and the concern as a certain level of erosion keeps. It's obviously less aggressive on North Randolph Road. That's where the clay bank bed has given way and has, has eaten back makes way back with the river it's just they took out some stakes that were put in last year that were a few feet off the edge so we're going to mark the edge of our right of way and keep an eye on it as it as it comes forward but um, so we haven't forgotten those and those are moving along uh, on fashion, so. yep are those something that might happen this year north randolph road yes Lower stock farm, I think we need to see what comes back, what are the options, figure out cost, figure out funding, um, and, and try to, to, to figure out what the timing is. Because one of the options, I guess, is that if that comes up far enough, it could become some sort of emergency management FEMA style eligible type of remediation. But it's, I think it would be preferable not to lose the road to then, to then fix it all if we can figure out a way to maybe to do something before that in that case. Yeah. Just given, I mean, it's a, I'll say significant connector, but it is, it is regularly used by not just the people who live there, by others uh, as well, so. Um, much as I try and separate my recreation from my public service, uh, I get an earful every time I go to Montague from somebody about the general conditions of the roads and specifically their road. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering what the paving schedule is for this summer so that I can... Right. Uh, and and the, other, the other thing I keep hearing about, and this seems to be a pretty widespread concern, and I've noticed it myself, there are a number of streets where the manholes are really mm -hmm. either sinking or popping up or yeah. protruding, and, and I, I don't know if there's some um, interim measure that can be taken to mitigate those situations. But, uh. Yeah, we should be, uh, one of the things we've been out doing is um, we had East Bethel Road in the capital improvement program flowing from an earlier project list, so that, that's still in there. But what we're thinking is because the paving reserve's in a healthy spot, we have so much need that we can identify some areas for some other treatments to include in that paving RFP as well, so that could be another two to four or more candidates that we put in there, whether they be whole streets or sections. But we're thinking something more more um, in, on the minimal end, um, either a shim and overlay, much like we did with Weston, for example, mm -hmm. um, or if there's something where there might be some sort of kind of lighter end mill on an overlay as sort of a, um, if, say our goal is to get all of our pavement townwide into good condition, which is sort of the general goal that you'll see with these plans. We're not sort of five years out from that based on condition and just the number of miles. We're probably a couple of iterations of that out. So mm -hmm. there are ways that we can jump from where we're at closer to good, hold the line, get into a maintenance cycle, and then move that over a, you know, whether it be a 10 or 12 year period. 
would say. Um, I mean, we get up to that average baseline or, or sooner, depending on, on how things go. So they've been out, they're marking those, they're measuring those up so that we can put those in the bid. And I was blanking out bid documents today, so we should be sooner than later to be able to fully answer that question. And then we'll roll in just putting that paving plan together so then we can answer that question for five years at a time will be the goal. And we'll update it annually to, to, to account for condition changes. <coughs> We'll also see what prices do. Um, if I recall, School Street and Weston were dealt with kind of late summer or early fall last year. Is that yeah, the? paving bids went out and were awarded, I think, in July. Um, mm -hmm. And then so we got them, those projects were actually done, I think it was September or October that they, that they yeah, actually yeah, happened, yeah. Um, along with Fish Hill. And, and so the idea is that if we can get out sooner than later, we can both have some competition, link things up. We still might be, I think we're still a little later than we'd prefer to be, so next year we yeah. have to keep trying to inch it up some more, but we are two and a half months ahead of what we were last year. Were they talking about Randolph Avenue? Um, they were, that was one of the, one of the places. They but they weren't talking about their driveway, right? No. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and, and one of the more vocal complainants was actually somebody who I understand used to be in here a lot talking about Weston Street, um, John, John um, Joy. Um, and he happens to be my partner in the league this year. So I finally had to tell him on the tee the other day, you know what, John? You know, we're kind of here to play golf. <laughs> I'll look into your issues. But he was, of course, happy that Weston Street got yeah. dealt with last year, yeah. but um, uh, I don't recall there were any, there was just a general malaise about road conditions, and, um, but a couple of people particularly mentioned the, the, the condition of some of the manhole covers, and I just thought I'd inquire. And we may even have an, a proposal for you to consider at some point too, where we um, much like we did with the sweep, we we'll invest in some some equipment so that we can extend what we're capable of with our resources beyond um, sort of the pothole patching. Because we already do have a roller that broke as part of the patching the other day, a hose issue. But um, so we do have some equipment that we can combine um, so that maybe we can do sections of, of, of repair, improve mm -hmm. sort of the overall quality, stabilize things a little bit better. And so we're, we're still working on some other creative ways to how do we get the most out of our own resources. But I think we'll have a much more comprehensive plan coming out of all of this. But I think we'll see, certainly this year, there's the potential to do a little more than we were expecting and, and to try to spread it out. That's one of the things we've tried to be conscientious of, too, is to make sure we're getting some of the improvements um, as broadly based as possible. Uh, so, something else I was told, again, by one of the complainants is, uh, I, I don't know whether this is accurate or not, that 45 feet on each side of the railroad tracks, the, the railroad is responsible for um, the road repair. Does that make any sense at all? Uh, that I, is not accurate. I, say, uh -huh. I did not think it was accurate. It sounded really far-fetched to me. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I just know that right along the track on Brook Street, as you drive down towards my house, the road is just falling away from the edge of the track, and there's a pothole easily six inches deep that we just kind of navigate around. Um, I, I, it didn't sound, it sounded pretty far-fetched to me, Trini, so. Um, <laughs> they would just as soon your road fall away. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're gonna have to, I put up with them going behind my house, so three times a day, so I guess I can live with their potholes, too. <laughs> I actually love trains. I don't mind them, so. Are we working on um, contract with Dean and Kay on Maple Street? <clears throat> Reached out again as sort of another prompt to see if we could schedule some time to figure out the remaining scope. So hopefully we'll be able to set that up and maybe even have something before you. I think the goal would be by, by the June meeting if we need authorization for something. And hopefully that can have a timeline and we can tell you know, residents at what point we might be able to post something that's a little more specific uh, in terms of what's going to happen. If you have neighborhood meetings, I don't know all of those. Right? Yeah, we'll let, let folks know. Any 
more items, Trevor? Uh, I don't think so. Can I forget anything? And a motion to go through the two step process for executive session. Be reminded of the language. Yeah, so you, you are being asked to consider a motion to find that executive session is necessary and prudent and that premature general public knowledge would place the town at a disadvantage. I will make said uh, uh, motion. Second. All votes in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Now you consider a motion, if you were so inclined, to enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313 A1A contracts, 1 VSA 313 A2 real estate. Uh, I will make said motion that we go into executive session for those two purposes. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Take a five minute break and come back in the next session.